Oh, good morning, beautiful people of San Francisco Bay Area. Welcome to our library. We're so happy you joined us on this Saturday morning to be here. And feel free to come in closer. There are books for sale outside. The bathrooms are outside to your right, kind of behind the stairs. There's book sales. And after today's event, we're gonna ask you to go ahead and directly go into the correct lobby for mingling. We have a Shakespeare event coming up at two. Go have lunch, come back, attend the event. So actors will be getting ready. So we will need to clear out. Um, I think that's all the housekeeping. We do have a lot of events coming up. On the back table is flyers for any of our upcoming events. And coming up, we have Poetry Month, Climate Action Month, and then we're gonna be heading into Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Month. So, so many amazing programs, and we celebrate all the time, all year long. And we love that you are back here in person and joining us. The San Francisco Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded and ancestral homeland of the Ramutush Ohlone peoples who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland, and as uninvited guests, we pay our um, respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramutush community. And with that, I'd love to shout out the Segorite Land Trust, which is an all-women-led organization out of the Bay East Bay, and they are doing a lot of work in land rights, land back movement, and they will actually be appearing with us virtual library in April. So we've been trying to get them on the stage for a long time, so it's gonna, they're very busy. So please don't miss out on that, look for it. And today we are so excited to have a partnership with DVAN, the Diasporic Vietnamese Artist Network. And this is our second event of the season. We have, I wanna say four more events coming up that is on the calendar, so keep a lookout. If you don't get our email, please sign up. If you have a card, you probably get your email and it's in your spam box somewhere. We send out reminders. Our next event will be with DVAN will be at Medicine for Nightmares on April 14th. So we like to do a lot of outside events and partner at bookstores, best bookstore in the mission right now. Check them out. I would love to introduce Isabel Palou who is a professor in Asian American Studies at San Francisco State and the co-director of DVAN. She is the author of This Is All I Choose to Tell, History and Hybridity in Vietnamese American Literature and the co-editor of the award-winning Troubling Borders, an anthology of art and literature by Southeast Asian women in the diaspora. Welcome, Isabel. Hello, everyone. Yeah, yeah, okay. <sighs> well, thank you for being here on Saturday morning. You know, I just uh, don't come very often to the library on Saturday morning, so I really commend you for doing that. Um, so, um, yeah, so my name is Isabel Tripelo, right? Uh, and I want to thank also uh, Anissa Maladi at the San Francisco Public Library for co sponsoring this event and for allowing us to hold this exciting program here at the Spacious Correct Auditorium and also our staff, Cheryl Tran, who's selling book outside. Uh, I want to thank uh, Lynn Papin, who's going to be here for flying all the way from Paris uh, to be here with us today to discuss um, her English language debut, The Girl Before Her, uh, published by uh, Ink and Blood. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of the story behind the translation of this book. Uh, you know, with Divan, we used to do a lot of uh, public events to uh, uplift and make visible the voice of uh, diasporic Vietnamese writers, right, in a context where uh, sometimes, you know, it's, uh, it feels like I still need this right now. 
But during the pandemic, uh, you know, we say, oh, what are we going to do? We cannot do public events. So we thought, oh, because uh, right now, you know, in the US, uh, population is 60% white and 40% people of colors. In California, people of colors are majorities, and yet the 90% of uh, the publishing industry is white. Um, <clears throat> and if we look at literary price, sometimes you will think that, you know, everybody's doing well, but um, but actually, um, uh, things with the, uh, you know, um, out of 220 books, uh, bestseller for fiction by New York Times in 2020, uh, only 20 books were published by people of color. So we felt like, oh, maybe we can knock at some doors and work for publishing uh, industries to uh, see if we can provide some opportunities for desperate Vietnamese writers. And we did this, and one of our uh, partner is Kaya Press, a small press uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, with them, we uh, got, received some funding uh, with uh, Stephen Kuting. Uh, we grateful to him, and we uh, decided to do translation. It's very difficult to translate books from other countries into English. So open door for this to facilitate um, uh, you know, like understanding across borders because Vietnamese were scattered in different parts of the world. It felt it's very good for the community to, to, to speak to each other and for those work to be, trans, you know, to be translated. And we also work with TTUP, Texas Tech University Press. So by uh, the end of this year, after two years of hard work and one of our editors, um, um, you know, part of the uh, editorial team actually is here, uh, Professor Carl Brito. Uh, we work with uh, Monique Strong and Bien Tan Nguyen's and um, Kwe Mai, Nguyen Kwe Mai um, and Ben Trans to help select uh, those books. And by the end of this year, we'll have eight books published. So it really makes a difference, you know, for us to, to work together. All right. Uh, so... So this is the first book that we translated, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's <clears throat> in French, it's the Law, Les Eaux des Filles, and now we translate it to The Girl Before Her, because translation you know, is very difficult, and we'll talk about this. But I'm going to stop now, and we'll have our stars. In, uh, in France, Lynn Papin is extremely famous. You know, she's telling me like she, you know, she had 100,000 copies and she's on TV and magazine everywhere. Everybody knows her. So I'm really happy to introduce her uh, to you today. Um, so, so she's born in Hanoi. Lynn Papin moved to France at the age of 10. And she's the author of five critically acclaimed novels, L'Eveil, uh, published in 2016, Tony in 2018, Les Eaux des Filles, that we're translating in 2019, and uh, <coughs> win winner of the Reader's Prize of Le Livre de Poche. And Le Coeur en Laisse, also in 2021, and In Vie Possible, two 2020. And she lives and writes in Paris, and The Girl Before Her is the first book, yeah, translated in English. So, uh, you know, I'm, one thing that's Amazed me about Lynn, right? She's uh, published a book every uh, year and a half, and she started when she was 20. So uh, please uh, welcome Lynn Papa. Yes. Yes. How many of you uh, can understand French a little bit? All right. Okay. So, Lynn, bonjour. <laughs> we, and I happen to be French Vietnamese, so it's, a, it's really a pleasure, and to be mixed race too. So, it's really a pleasure to welcome you, Lynn. Uh, <clears throat> so, we, maybe we'll start with asking you to maybe read in French the, the, the yes. beginning of your book. Okay. Yes. So, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I will try to speak English my best, but since I'm French, of course, my English is not perfect. <laughs> Uh, so I will uh, read the beginning of the book uh, in French. Um, so uh, Les Eaux des Filles is a, a book about uh, three generations of uh, women. So my grandmother, my mother and me. Uh, and the character uh, of the little girl in the beginning of the book uh, goes back to Vietnam in order to um, retrace and to find the... Um, uh, like to go back to the, the roots. 
Donc, comme souvent depuis ma naissance, je suis à l'aéroport entre deux continents, le pied droit sur l'un, le pied gauche sur l'autre. J'attends un vol et une énigme se dessine, celle d'une terre ronde que les avions contournent en laissant les gens derrière. Cette boule si compacte, ces vies si courtes, ces pays et ces mers, tout en est su, dit, et pourtant la guerre éclate à l'intérieur. Les avions passent. J'attends ce matin-là, assise dans un fauteuil, mon passeport à la main. Sur ce document qu'ils ont tous autour de moi, les identités sont inscrites. Le calme est absolu ici. Les gens se tiennent, ils feuillettent un magazine, tapotent leur portable sans se juger, contrairement aux passants des rues ou aux parleurs des cafés. Dans les aéroports, nous sommes tous sur le départ, sur l'arrivée, entre le ciel et la terre, avec notre bout d'identité en main, susceptible d'être recalé à tout moment. Monsieur, la carte d'embarquement, passez par la machine, ça sonne, enlevez vos chaussures, c'est bon, allez-y. Et des conneries, Sky Priority, vous voyagez en business ou en économique, vous avez le passeport biométrique puis les gens, les affolés, les détendus, les pressés, ceux qui s'endorment et ceux qui doublent la file. On est là, à poil, des humains, rien d'autre, sous l'autorité des avions. Enlevez la ceinture, ça sonne. Attachez votre ceinture, ça décolle. On attend. Les annonces se font dans des haut-parleurs. Il est temps d'embarquer. Où je vais Au Vietnam, à Hanoï. Comme il y a cinq ans, dix ans, quinze ans, comme toujours, chaque fois différemment, chaque fois seul, pour tenter de réconcilier le passé et le présent, les deux continents et mes membres souffrants, pour tenter de me réconcilier. Merci, merci. Well, um, in short, because je faisais partie. De, oh, I'm sorry. I, I was I was part of the the editorial teams, you know, with Carl's, and then we, you know, read your. We, you know, we had all those books to read, and we read and, you know, read your book. He had uh, such, um, you know, he really got us. You know, the originality of your voice, the poetics of your voice. Uh, the musicality of it. I don't know if you hear it, right? It's in French, it's. You know, it's, 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 it's really beautiful. Uh, but uh, when we translated it, it was uh, difficult. Uh, we had to uh, hire two different um, uh, translators, and I got involved. It was, it was big. And one thing, I mean, I'm bilingual, but it's, you know, like words in different language has. Well, you can, you can hear me. <laughs> uh, yes. Has different, oh, here we go. Have different resonance, different associations, different connotations. So, for example, the, thank you. <laughs> the word uh, war, right? Uh, you know, you, 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 you speak in, in French, the, the word war is guerre. And, and you know, I, was, I didn't realize until we work on your book that that word in French has almost a romantic connotation. It's, it's very common to use it. And you have it in songs, you have it in everyday language, you know, when people don't get along, it's talk about the war between us, you know, it's, 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 it's very, um, there's intimacy to the body with, you know, and, and the everyday life almost, right, in culture. The word war, war you know, in, in, in English, uh, you know, it's cold, it's distance. You think of it in historical books or, or, or political discourse, and, and you don't, you know, it's much more distant relationship to the self. Uh, and then you were born after the war, right? So for you, war has different, um, uh, you know, meanings. And, and in the text, you, 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 you compare, you know, what happened in you when you left Vietnam and what happened afterward, you know, you really missed Vietnam to such a degree that you had, a, you know, a mental health issue, you know, with such a strong nostalgia. And you compare, you know, what happened inside to war. And then when we read it in English, it was a little bit of a reaction because people don't do that here. So maybe can you explain to us, you know, a little bit more, uh, you know, about this usage of war and maybe, you know, what your intent in using it? Well, I, I think the, the book was really about um, what you, like, uh, receive from other generations. So uh, I um, divided the text in three parts. So it's like three wars. And when I started to write the book, I, I wondered why uh, the little girl I was had suffered so much from wars she did not 
live, you know. So there is like a, a transmission and a research in get uh, of like what my parents, like my, my mother, because it's about uh, my mom, uh, has um, lived and my grandmother. And so we call it um, la mémoire transgénérationnelle, which means uh, what you receive, f like, um, almost at the end, you know, like what your parents, your grandparents live and what you carry when you, you are born, maybe you carry this, uh, the memory of this. So this is why I, um, there is a, a metaphor b between the, the wars my ancestors lived and the war we maybe carry within us. But of course in French we can, we can say uh, la guerre, it's maybe a word that is more uh, intimate than war in English. And also for um, the translation, in French, the book was called uh, Les eaux des filles, which means um, the bones of the girls, because it was a book about um, mother, uh, grandmother, and so about birth. And um, there was a, a play on word, because in, in French, when you say les eaux, you also hear uh, les eaux, which means what the water. And so when like women give birth, we say um, women, uh, elles perdent les eaux, which means they... Um, like the, wat the water the baby grows in. And so uh, it was really a book about how you come to the world, like the, the, the water you are in, in the womb of the mother, and then the bones uh, people left behind when they die. So it's really about how you come into the world and how you leave the world. So it, it was, it's, it, it's quite a metaphoric book, but of course with the translation in English, it's very complicated to, to translate all these uh, metaphors. <laughs> Yes, no, thank you. There was a word, a word that we really ponder and discuss and even fight over, right, on the translation side. It was, uh, yeah, so, um, uh, so for you, what I hear is about historical trauma, you know, like how, uh, you know, war or the outcome of war, the damage of war is passed, one, is passed on from one generation to the next and somehow is in your bone, is inside you and you know how do you make sense of it without memory and and that term is called trauma you know resonate in the US but, you know so um yeah yeah so thank you for for explaining um it really makes it makes sense um well just wanted to know right like uh, why wh why why did you write this novel or, or this auto fictions or people call it creative non fictions right uh what did why is it meaningful to you and what's your relationship now to it i mean you wrote it when you know you were 22 published in 23 now you 27 <laughs> it's not too far but you know how, what's the relationship to it to you now? I, before this book, this is my uh, third novel, so I published uh, <laughs> I published two, uh, two, nov two fictional novels before because I always like to write and imagine stories so, and read books, of course, so it has always been something uh, important for me, but I have, ha haven't uh, told about like myself and my story. It was more uh, fictional. And uh, my two first novels were like well received. And I had dinner with a friend and I showed him a picture of me when I was 16 years old. And it was a, a moment in my life when I was uh, sick. So I was like very um, skinny. And when I, I showed him this picture, my friend told me, well, since you are a writer, you I think you really need to write about this girl, this little girl of of 16 years old, and and he told me this is like this is the story you need to write, and so I answered well, I I always thought I would write about it, but maybe more like when I'm 35, when I'm like a woman and I'm like confident about myself, and he told me this is so weird to want to write about something, but. But like you think you will do it in 15 years, so why don't you do it now? <laughs> and then I began to write, but just like a um, therapeutic thing for me, 
I, I didn't really want to publish it. It was more, okay, um, I'm going to try to write about this uh, girl and this illness, uh, which was anorex anorexia. This is why also it is called um, Les eaux des filles, so the bones referred to um, the war and the... Of the like the skinny people during the war because uh, they had like a ration ticket and but also anorexia and the girls in the hospital with me because I I, I went to hospital for one year so there is also all this um, uh, tra trajectory uh, and so I began to write about this girl of 16 years old and uh, like it was a natural thing to talk about my mother and and Vietnam and all and so this was the beginning of uh, of the the writing, and and then when I had done with the book, I gave it to my publisher, and I I told him I don't know if it's something I, I don't know if it's a real book, and if so, if it's something I want to publish, I don't know if it's like uh, maybe um um, comment dire uh, impudique? How do you say in English impudique? Uh, well, I think maybe it's too private, and he read it and he said no, this is like the book <laughs> so so then then the adventure began <laughs> yeah. sorry you had to, to go through that um i mean i have you know we have a different generations right like the the the, the it, it was really like a healing process yes. Uh, yes. for me and when people read it um i think it's also a, a book that uh heals people uh even though they are not vietnamese or even though they haven't um live the um, like going from a country to another but they still can assimilate to the feeling uh, of um, the the many feelings in the book even though they they didn't have the same story but there are a lot of feelings like of being uh, new somewhere or uh, don't feel you belong to somewhere or um, the link with the mother so there is many um Porte d'entrée to the book. <laughs> I don't know. Opening. Yes, actually, when I, I read it, uh, it, I mean, it did that for me because when I was 16, I didn't want to live and I was super skinny. There was no word for it, but uh, when I look at pictures, like, oh, yeah, no, that was no good. Yeah, so it was nice to have, uh, and it was not nostalgia to Vietnam because I was born in France, but I knew I was did not belong. I was, you know, it was clear I was not treated as French, although that's all I knew. So your, your, your stories and validated uh, some of the part of myself that had remain hidden. So thank you for that. Um, uh, well, you know, talking about, you know, with different generations, right, you, you could be, you know, the age of my, my, my son, right, or even younger. Uh, you know, here in the US, um, you know, I mean, when things I was uh, reflecting on it is like in 1975, actually, Maxine Honkingston uh, wrote this book, uh, uh, The War Woman Warriors. You know, it's very, you know, extremely well-established book here. Um, but the way, because she struggled with uh, identities as an Asian-American woman, she really traced through her book, uh, you know, the mother, the, the, the woman lineage, right, to the book. And then through this, she was able to, to find strength uh, for a narrator or for herself to navigate what is meant to be an uh, Asian American woman, uh, you know, here, right? Because it was a lot of denial uh, or, 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 you know, non accepted or not seen as equal. So for you, right, it's like 50, almost 50 years later, uh, you know, here you're in France, you know, mixed erasions, and then it seems to also trace uh, the stories of, of, of your mother, of your grandmother, of your nannies, of your aunties. So I was just wondering, you know, is it for the same reason? Did it help you to, to do this exploration to find strengths in relation to your identity as a mixed race woman or as a woman? Um, well, I think it's uh, really a book about uh, women because it's not like the um, the the angle is really a woman and what has like the transmission. And I think because when I uh, grew up in Vietnam, I was in um, 
kind of a, a world with a woman because um, my grandmother was here, my mother, my aunts, I had a nanny, and there, there was a kind of feminine world. And then when we came in France, it was more masculine maybe, it was the country of my father, and um, my relationship with my mother really changed when we came in, in France because um, I think there was uh, this feeling of um, she had this feeling of like not belonging, and it's the the book is really written with the point of view of a of a child uh, looking up to um, like her mother trying to fit in, and I think it's quite complicated also for a child to. Um, to see that her mother uh, does not belong. And so when I was in Vietnam, like everybody was pointing at me like, oh, she's not from here, she's a stranger, she's French. And there was a, f um, I think um, it was, um, they were very, um, l like it was something good to be French out there. And uh, in in France, uh, everybody was also pointing at me like, oh, she's not from here, she's Vietnamese. So, you know, you always feel you, you don't belong where, wherever you are. But uh, in France, the connotation was not so good. So um, even as a child, when my mom came like to pick me up at school and I was 10 and she and she's like all the mo all the mothers were here and she began to speak speak to me in Vietnamese and I was like, no, 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 I parle français, like, I, I, I didn't want to be different. And so I felt there was maybe a kind of uh, racism, you know, it was not so easy at that time for uh, my mom to be in uh, Vietnamese in, in France. And so all that is also complicated for a child. So the book was really um, like going towards her and, and like, um, seeing what what she was, her life, her so it was really like um, how do you say um, the re recreate a link with the woman of my family, and voilà. <laughs> thank you. Well, maybe uh, you know as transition, you know to maybe can we ask you to read the beginning of the book a little bit? Yes. Yeah. I will. Try to read, but my English is not perfect, so sorry if I... <laughs> in Vietnam, there are places where people bury their loved ones for a period of three years in caskets appropriate to their size. Then, once that period has elapsed and the flesh has dissipated, whatever is left is transferred to a smaller box. Cemeteries are thus made up of small boxes of bones. The first casket is a transient public thing, a temporary resting place for bodies in motion, used to house a different body every three years. Its only purpose is to sift out bones. The second smaller box is permanent and entirely one's own. It contains nothing but bones. It's as if the flesh, changeable as it has been throughout life, sometimes fresh, plump and smooth, sometimes wrinkled, sickly and blemished, sometimes soft and dense, sometimes rough or sagging, sometimes scarred, no longer mattered. Once our flesh disappears, taking with it our earth, earthly sentiments and our muddy emotions, all that's left are bones, those essential things we feel in our bones. Ultimately, all of us end up like this, and there's a certain comfort to it. It's comforting because it's so mundane. Whatever injustices, upheavals, and dangers we might have suffered in life, sorry, <laughs> whatever joys, laughs, fears, loves, hatreds, resentments, passions, whatever accidents, journeys, crises, or illnesses, no matter how life has bent and twisted each of us, our bones remain our human bones, what we were and what we had tried our utmost to become. It's only now that I understand just how deeply we must love, how sincerely we must forgive, all the way down to those final bones. Thank you. Oh, the translation is good. <laughs> and when you read it, you okay. feel it. Um, yes, so the title, you know, The Girl Before Her, uh, you know, so I'm thinking of the writers before you, uh, you know, in an Asian American context, American context, uh, San Francisco context, you know, how to read it and, and to think it through. 
you know, in 1993, we have this writer here called Fa Mien Eng who wrote a, a book called uh, Bone about her growing up. She's Chinese American growing up in Chinatowns here. And, um, uh, you know, for her, the image of bone is associated with scarcity, you know, eating the bone of the pigeons, right? She's poor, by secrets, the bones in the closet, resentment, you know, bone to chew, right? Something embedded in the language, right? The, the, the word bone has different dissonant, uh, associations here. Uh, when we try to translate, you know, uh, in the, the, your, your, your books, you know, in, in English, you know, the, the bone of the girls didn't sound good, they sound crass, right? So we say, okay, we cannot do this. Uh, but when I hear you, you read, uh, you know, I, I think bone in the French context has different, yeah, it's just, it reminds me of, um, um, you know, about... Um, you know, the, some about death. Uh, it reminds me uh, of, of, of uh, also maybe like Albert Camus has this idea of the philosophy of the absurd. You know, you just not, uh, uh, you know, human are so, you know, it's not that important in grand things of things. Nature, you know, when human are gone, nature take over. Right? Uh, and also maybe a little bit of comic, uh, you know, in Buddhism, right? It's you go from one generation to another. So I just want to ask you, you know, for you, uh, this image of, of bone, you know, why, you know, why start this book uh, with this image? And it's so strong because it comes through the whole book, right? And then it was in the title. Uh, what you meant by it? Yeah, why? Well, I think it's, uh, what I told before, it's really a book about uh, what you leave behind. And since the beginning of the writing of this book was uh, like the um, the illness and it's um like a, i think a, a moment in my life where i i saw death you know um and it's something you like it's um so there is a lot of questions after that so what what is the meaning of life how do i come into this world what what do i want to do here and i really began to right when when i was 16 years old because i think it's the moment i i told myself well if you have to be here in this world what do you want to do and well i wanted to write so the book is really about um like death but and and birth but not in a in a sad way you know not in a how do you say in a scary way because i think also in our society society in uh, france and maybe here also we have um um, a link with death that is like so scary and so uh, like put in hospital cemeteries that these are like scary places but um, in Vietnam there is um, maybe more uh, um, how do you say there is maybe like maybe it's it's not that scary you know because people in their house have um, um, hotel uh, like they they used to speak to the dead and there is something uh, maybe like more um, soft with death and so um, the the book begins with that image because uh, it's a way of uh, like um, having a conversation about this you know but not a scary one just it's I mean we know it anyway we are all <laughs> I'm sorry, but we're all going to die. So <laughs> better know it and, and, you know, like having a nice philosophy with it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So it's really, I mean, you know, you, you were born in Vietnam. You, you left, you know, you spoke Vietnamese, English and French, right, when you were there and came here when you were 10, right? So you, you're, you're, you're culturally you Vietnamese and French, right? Um, yeah, um, not things links to to bone. Uh, well, you you know you speak about mental health, serious mental health. You know, being in a hospital for a whole year, right? As sixteen, seventeen, right? Um, you know, this is something that in Asian American literature, people you know say you know it's really or Asian American communities is more need to speak about it because often it's kept silence, it's taboo to. You know, don't talk about. You don't go to therapists because you know you think people you're crazy. You know, so but it's a very serious issues that uh, need to be talked. So it's wonderful that uh, I mean, although it's brave, you know, that you speak directly to it. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, it's it's taboo too in in France, and there are a lot of people suffering from it in different forms. I mean, it's not only like going to hospital, but it can uh, people can struggle with this in everyday life, and uh, nobody talks about it. And I think the book had been um, like had a well had been welcome in in France also with this issue because um, a lot of people could um, like were happy that. They could read about it, and they can, uh, for like people suffering of it, or parents uh, of like children suffering of it, and they couldn't have access to what their child was struggling with, and so the book also helped to like engage a conversation, and so yes, I think taboo is not a good thing because it it doesn't help. <laughs> You were able to uh, discuss this with your parents after this book was written in a way you couldn't. So it was healing for you to remember, process it, and then also to uh, have communications with your mom, right, and your dad. Yeah. Um, yes, so another, uh, you know, a lot of people asking you about, you know, this because it's really, you know, like, bomb in your face I mean you know talk about your war metaphor right it's really in your face about that but is there is another recurring stream that me that I saw in this book that maybe feed into this river of um, you know nostalgia and depressions and not wanting to live um, which um, refers to, to 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 the accidents that you you refer to. So maybe before we talk about it, maybe I'll ask you to read a passage from it, and maybe we can discuss it because I saw it a little bit. It's less visible, but throughout the text. So I want to talk about this since everybody asking you about uh, in, uh, anorexia. Um, so this is a, an excerpt of um, the chapter called Third. War, and it's the little girl uh, talking. Everyone keeps talking about a past that isn't yours, that you don't understand. So uh, it's when she arrives in France. Everybody else knows all about Marcel Marceau, Lucie Aubrac, Julien Grac, even Jacques Chirac, and French politics. This isn't a child's disconnect, it's a cul cultural disconnect. You are 12 and trapped in the grey, tangled, sunless maze of a France in crisis, a mess that isn't your own. You've lost your mothers and your country, and no one has bothered to ask how you feel about any of it. It all happened so quickly, and there you are completely alone in the middle of it. The young girl stops smiling, she is sitting on her bench as the Paris snow falls. Ice encroaches over the slats. She's waiting for her world to come back. There's a good chance it never will. Something about being here makes her feel like she's being dragged back to that moment when the decision to keep her or not was being made. She'd escaped then, but now here she was again. Yes, yes. The decision to keep her or not was uh, being made... Um so I think you're referring to this idea of, uh, you know, your mother, well, you know, I mean, your father was uh, studying Vietnam history in Vietnam, fell in love with your mom, they both fell in love, you know, and um, then she came, she got married, they, she became pregnant, she went to France, had the baby, came back to Vietnam, and then boom, another pregnancy, and she was young, and you know, and already they went all the way there, and then the hospital that was in, uh, you know, maybe '95, right? Is 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 right after the embargo with Vietnam, and the embargo, right? Is uh, you know when uh, you know is uh, you know when the U.S. is in a war with the country, it lose, you know, not only business cannot do business with that country, but all the friends of the U.S. are not allowed to do business with countries. And then, you know, it's a lot of, uh, I mean, there's a lot of reason for that poverty, but it was one of the reasons. Um, and, and then, you know, the hospital maybe didn't feel safe uh, to have an abortion uh, for your mother. Uh, and then though she had you, right? <laughs> you were born in, in, in that context. Um, so it's just, and then because I see it dropped in, you know, this illusion of accidents, of, of not being wanted, maybe in different contexts, but 
at this original context by a, um, a mother maybe young or not ready to have a baby. No, we all, uh, you know, as women understand that. Uh, I was just wondering, you know, if, if, you know, because as what I sense when I read this is that, and maybe see if I'm wrong, right? But that maybe you feel that whether you are wanted or not in the womb, uh, sip in the bones of the baby and then the young adult and then the adult and then somehow impact your 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 relationship to life or death. Uh, so I don't know, am I dreaming this? <laughs> or are you, you know, is it something you consciously uh, try to say uh, or believe even? I, I mean, it's, it was part of the, um, like... I don't, I, I don't know if research is the good word, word in English, but I mean the research I made about how I came uh, into this world. So I wanted, the book is about like um, the general context, which was uh, Vietnam War and the village in which my mother and my grandmother uh, grew up. So it like uh, La Guerre d'Indochine and then with uh, La Guerre uh, with the Americans. So it's like the, um, the general context. That is why I spoke also about the context in France with like uh, Jacques Chirac and like, you know, the, the history of the world and then the small history of uh, people uh, living during this time. And so it's like the small lives of people. And, and so I asked my, I mean, I was a, uh, a child, I, I received love and everything was, was fine, but I always felt that I was a bit different than my brother. And so I, I asked my mom like a lot of questions uh, about um, the village, the war, and also about my birth. And, and she answered me. And I was uh, quite I'm glad to hear all this because I think it's just the truth and sometimes I think we need to know uh, how we came into this world and I do think that we um, feel we feel what happened when we were little so this is uh, really a book about like the what we receive from the like uh, you said trauma but it's just what we receive from the world and from the like the big world and the small world we were born in. <laughs> yes, yes, actually remind me, um, you know, last week we had a, a reading with uh, Nguyen Kui Mai, she wrote a book about emigrations and uh, Dutch, uh, you know, Dutch child, uh, when the whole premise of the book at the end is about that, about, you know, like, I mean, it's different context, but the idea of telling the truth and a lot of women, uh, Vietnamese women, you know, with the American children, they, they conceal the truth in order to protect the child, but then the child always feels there is something and it's better to tell the truth. And it's a very good message to, to, to send to, 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 you know, for the older generation or to... to to, to really take it to heart that actually you think you protect the child but actually you don't and it's better to tell the truth you know this is a uh, yeah because I have experienced that with my mother as well anyway thank you uh, oh so we perfect with time so I would like to uh, well thank you very much and then maybe open uh, the floor for questions uh, any questions for Lynn Oh, she is. She's coming, I guess. Uh. Uh, well, my question is, um, how does your mother feel about yes. you writing and researching her? And I think some women are elderly with big problems. Mm -hmm. You'll write it, so we're trying to understand what goes. Well, it's a good question. <laughs> I uh, on the the French cover, it's a picture of uh, my mother and my grandmother. So, like the. Um, it was quite striking because it was all over in libraries and TV shows in France and it was her actually, it was not me, you know, it was her picture. And she, um, when, I, when I wrote the book and when it went, went out, I, I thought maybe or she will like, like it and it will create a, a real 
um, bond between us, or she will not like it at all, and it will be really bad. And she uh, took it as a, like steps towards her. So she was uh, very proud. All the more as uh, I think she did not had really her voice, you know, like to speak in in France. And um, there was all the thing that I I told before about like. Um, not speaking really well the language and feeling maybe a little bit of racism and being always um, like having less uh, pl place, room <laughs> than my father. And so I think she was uh, really proud of the book and really proud of being on the cover of it. And so it was uh, like a real reconciliation between us, you know, it was and it really created something also, I think, uh, for her to um, see uh, what uh, was inside me, you know, because when you, also when you raise your children, um, you don't have the perspect perspective of, of your child because you think like you were here before and he's born and you raise him or her. So you, you think you know, but, but it's not the same story. So uh, I think it was really, it was a good thing for us to... <laughs> Uh, I'm French-Vietnamese too, but I've lived in the U.S. for f nearly 40 years now, but I was raised, came to France uh, when I was 12, so a um, <laughs> long time ago, during the war, so that's the difference between us. Um, you don't talk about your father, so conversely, if your mom feels good about this book, doesn't he feel like he didn't raise you enough in his side of your culture and protect you when you came to his country. Well, this is a, <laughs> this indeed, when the book came out, he was like, but why don't you talk about me in the book? Like in the book, I'm, I'm just the guy sitting in his office and I don't like it. <laughs> but you know, when you write the book, you don't write like the whole uh, truth. You are obliged to have a, an angle. And here the, the title is, um, the girl before her, so it's really like the maternal uh, lignée, like the um, lineage. So the um, like when when I began to write, I was really focused on the woman in my family, and I I, I didn't want to write about my father. So um, you can I, I didn't write also about my brother, and I think it was also a way to protect him because I feel like when you are a writer um, and if you write about your family, it's like you you hold them in hostage, you know? You, it's not, I don't, I think it's a, a feeling that can be weird for them. And so I always try to be um, correct and, you know, to respect that. But um, the book was really about the maternal lineage. So it's like, of course, there is not much about my father in it. But you were not raised in the French community in Hanoi? Uh, I was, I was, but the, um, the book was uh, like, uh, um, because I was so much French and I did all my study in French and I learned French history uh, in class and French philosophy and French, everything French. <laughs> and also I read in French and I think in French and I write in French, so I, did not feel the need to search this French uh, lineage because I had so much French already. So the book was really about what I lack, and it was the Vietnamese uh, lineage and the and the woman um, because I, I feel really close to my dad, and I was raised in a like like a boy, you know, <laughs> like really. So I, I I wanted to search about the woman. Um, again, thank you for being here uh, in the U.S. Um, so, two questions. Um, first is, uh, if I missed this, I, I apologize. Did you um, defer or uh, spoke to your mom about passages? Did you check in with her or um, along the process of your writing? Or um, does she see your book after its completion? And then the second question is just basic. If uh, you have it in three languages in one book, do you have it in um, Vietnamese, uh, French, and English? 
You mean the translation or uh, compiled into one? I'm just I'm just wondering. Ah, uh, no, no, no. Uh, and the first question, uh, I asked a lot of questions to my mother uh, at the beginning of the writing. So I uh, went to her place and I asked her a lot about her childhood because before I began uh, to write this book, I had no idea she, she grew up in a village during the war. I mean, she never uh, told me about it. And I also never asked my grandfather. So I went, uh, I took a, a plane to Vietnam and I went there and I told my grandfather I want to go to the village and I want to see the village. So we took a car, we went there. And um, I was um, happy to do it because I think without the book, uh, I wouldn't maybe have um, the curiosity to go there and to ask so much questions. And, you know, like my grandmother uh, passed away before I, I began to ask questions and to write. And so I was also glad to do it before my grandfather uh, go goes away <laughs> because uh, they have like so much history. They live like incredible things. And we and if we don't ask them, I don't they don't tell it. So, um, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, sorry, I, I forgot to. Uh, include this in the question. Were there any sections um, that you had to omit uh, because, or ah. not include uh, because your family, uh, grandparents, uh, your mother asked that you exclude them from the book? Uh, no, not really. I mean, my uh, Vietnamese family is really uh, open to to tell everything. It's more maybe the, the, the family of my father, the French family is maybe more uh, uh, scared and like a lot of taboo and you know, so maybe that's the reason why I never uh, wrote about them. <laughs> but uh, the Vietnamese, my Vietnamese family is quite, um, and they like to, to, do, to tell things and my mom is also uh, like okay with uh, telling the truth and so. Hi, thank you. Um, it's a very interesting interview. Um, maybe you cover this in the book. I'm just curious because um, you mentioned how when you go when you moved to France, that you were perceived as Vietnamese, and so you felt this negative um, conception of that, your identity, maybe. Um, but from the outside, you don't look that Vietnamese. So I don't know if you explore. What you, or explain what your experiences are that were negative? Because um, you don't look... Vietnamese. I don't look Vietnamese? No, I do. Not <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. But uh, may, like in, I, <laughs> maybe in, in summer when I, I am 10, people talk in Spanish to me. They say like, hola. So <laughs> maybe. But uh, no, as a, as a child, I, I don't look totally French, I mean, but um, now is more, maybe it's more accepted now, but like uh, 15 years ago, you know, it, uh, and when we arrived, we didn't arrive in Paris, we arrived in uh, first, the first years in, in Tours, in a small town, and there were not like much uh, stranger, they were all really French. <laughs> and so um, I think, yes, it was quite uh, complicated at that time and also the to arrive from a country that was so um, like um, warm and hot and people uh, live in the streets in Vietnam so as a child I, I was used to like always hear a lot of uh, you know agitation and sound and like the um, the motorbikes and it was really a, a universe and I'm quite uh, sensitive I think of the the universe so it, it was like being, you know, a fish in the water and then being dropped out on earth and like, it's it's not, it, I was, I think, uh, really um, perturbated about this change and it, it was cold and in Vietnam there were no, like everybody is, you know, walking in the street and in France it's like really, yeah, really cold and um, also the the food, the clothes, the so it's all this I think that was quite difficult to, to fit in, in a new culture. <laughs> you have any questions right here? Okay. Uh, 
Hi, Lings. My name is Wing. I, am, I was a university classmate of some mother. And uh, I would like to tell to everybody that the mother of Ling was very, very beautiful uh, girl. And she was a silent student during five years at this university. And uh, it was said that, uh, and I think uh, maybe uh, Zurich, Zurich cannot find very traditional girl a lady in this book. Is it true? We, uh, do you, you said that you try to go uh, to go to the places mm -hmm. to know about more about the mother? Did you meet some mother friends in Hanoi or to talk with them? And we are, I think we are very, we was very uh, unique generation women in Vietnam that we were sent to Soviet Union to study. And uh, our favorite songs, favorite books were Soviet Union books. So uh, I hope to read, in, I didn't read the book. Uh, before I came here, I asked the mother, how do you think about the book? She said, she said you will read it. You, you read and you will know, but uh, I'm very curious about the book because I, I want to read my friends, to read myself and to see myself in their eyes. <laughs> and today I invite my daughter to uh, be here to see. We, I, I'm very excited to see our children, how are they, who are they. So thank you for presentation of the book. I would like thank to you. know the children. What woman in the book? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Lynn, would you uh, talk a little bit about your path with language, uh, since French is your second language? Maybe it's your first written language. I'm not sure, but uh, finding the confidence in that path and getting to be able to write it. Um, I um, I always uh, have. Uh, I've, I've been in a French school in Vietnam, so French is uh, like the only language I, I read in and write and, and think. Uh, but my first, uh, I mean, my first language was Vietnamese, but when I was very, very small with my mom and my nanny and my grandmother. But um, French has, has been the, the language I, I know better. But I think I have been really uh, like... Um, 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 how do you say uh, uh, influence and and strike struck by by um, having different language, but because I think when you like when you lack words like I do now, <laughs> you can not express everything you want. So this has all also an effect on my relationship with my mother, for example, because I hadn't so much words in Vietnamese, so I couldn't express everything I wanted, and I couldn't even think uh, about a lot of things. So um, this is maybe why I'm also a writer, because uh, language has so much uh, effect on our um, thoughts on how we um, like feel in the world. I think maybe like when you have more words, you can uh, understand more things, you know. And this is why I think books are so different as when you watch a movie, because when you watch a movie, you watch uh, images. But when you read books, you have words, and then you keep these words with you, and you think with words, and you like in interact with other people with words and so words are really a, um, a bridge I don't know if you can say that but a bridge to life you know so like the more you read and the more you have uh, words and image and, and the more your relationship with the world is um, like um, nourishing and big and you know so I think I, I really had this feeling when I was a child um, with like English uh, French, being raised with uh, three different languages, I, I knew that I had different relationship with the world uh, when I was um, thinking in a, a language or another. And maybe because like in English, I have only like some words and not that much. And it's maybe more like positive words. When I <laughs> think in English, I feel like more fun and light. And when I think in French, it really goes deep, <laughs> you know. So uh, this is, yes, the language is really important for me. Uh, but I, I don't know if I answered your question correctly. 
Okay. <laughs> So in this journey about discovering your mother and being Vietnamese, what was it that you discovered about being Vietnamese that is impactful to your life right now? Um, I have a, a relationship that uh, evolves with Vietnam because uh, when I, I grew up, I was born there and I grew up there until I was 10. So for a long time, it was a childhood for me. It was like the paradise, like lost paradise. And, and when I came back there, I wanted to come back to my childhood. And I realized that you never go back into your childhood. Like it's something you can you cannot go back in time. It's like when you you know you grew up in a house and you imagine this house is like so big and so nice, and and you come back like 20 years later, it's very small. And and so I had this relationship with Vietnam. And wh whenever I went back to Hanoi, I I always wanted to go back to like the Hanoi of my childhood. And well. I never could because um, it changed and also the, the city changed a lot. And now when I go back, um, it, it always evolves. I, I went back there a month ago and it was the first time I was like, oh, I, I go there as a woman for the first time and not as a child. Because when I go there, I feel I usually feel like I'm 10 years old. <laughs> I'm like, what are the things of my, my childhood? And it was the first time I was like, okay, wh what is it to be like a, a grown up there? And and so I think since it's, it's the place where I was born, I think it will always, uh, I will always have a, a conversation with this place. Maybe, like maybe if I have children one day, I would like to bring my, my children there and it will be something new to, you know, I, there are places like this. I think they are always um, inter, interrogo, interrogate us. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I didn't have my hand up, but I will say a couple of words. I, I um, uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, Lean that I'm so thrilled that the book is out, um, and I, I just want, I, I'm really happy that you read those two passages from the beginning of the novel because I think they they capture a lot of what um, drew me into the book, and I think also Isabel and you know for people who, who may not have caught all of the French that you were reading at the beginning, it was a scene of traveling, right, getting on the plane, being in the airport, and a kind of meditation on that disorienting space of the airport, but it's also bound up in that other early passage about the bodies and, and the caskets. And what's, I think for me, so striking about the beginning of the book is that in that airport scene, you have one version of a body that is reduced to its essentials, which is the biometric passport, right? So you have this document of French identity that is linked to you and no one else. And then on the other hand, you have the bodies that are, that are initially in larger coffins, and then after the body decomposes, the bones are put into these smaller caskets. But of course, that whole process right, is one that requires a community and requires a family and requires people to continue caring for the remains of that body after death. Right? And you talked a little bit about the ways in which um, you know, a, a kind of ongoing relationship to ancestors is quite characteristic of Vietnamese culture. And I think, you know, in a very moving way, that's what you're doing in this book as well, right? You're, you're creating that sort of casket for an ongoing relationship to history and to the history of your mother and your grandmother, right? So, so in a way, the book itself is, is kind of a version of the the small casket containing these remains that continue to signify because you're carrying their story. So I just wanted to say thank you again for, for the book. It's a really beautiful book. Thank you. And yes, this makes sense since the, the French title was Les Eaux des Filles, so it's really, you know, a casket of, of bones. But uh, indeed, the book is, is uh, really about body and when the, um, just the, the, the excerpt after this of the airport, uh, when she lands, she's in the taxi going to the airport to Hanoi. And I mean, I mean, she, I mean, the character, because it's more simple to speak. <laughs> and then she turns back and in the, um, 
the places um, behind in the taxi, she sees uh, three girls, and it's the girl of 16 years old, the girl of 10 years old, and the girl of five years old. And because I, I think like in life we are like, um, how do you say, pupirus, you know, the Russian puppet, Russian dolls, and we have like many versions of ourselves, all in, and we are like today a doll, but we have all the little dolls inside ourselves too. And so uh, it's, yes, really about uh, this. Hi, um, thank you so much for coming today and for this talk and for writing your story and writing the story of the woman in your family. Um, earlier, you spoke a little bit about the, the universal appeal of the book for audiences. Um, uh, you said that they, uh, there, there are various portes d'entrée, um, which um, is, is, is true. And I'm, I'm wondering um, what perhaps has been the response that you've noticed over the, f over the years since the book's publication in French readership um, and the different things that strike you about how um, French readers respond versus readers in the Asian community in France. Um, yeah. Um, well, uh, if uh, I'm not sure I really understood the, the whole question, but <laughs> if uh, I think there were the, um, the book was uh, received in like very various ways because um, well, what, what I like when, when readers um, tell me about the books is that they come to see me, but they don't talk about me. They don't talk about the book. Like they don't say, oh, um, I read the book and you uh, live that. They talk about themselves. So they come and they say, oh, I recognize myself because um, like this is my experience. And sometimes they recognize themselves like in the, um, like in experience. For example, one reader told me uh, this book was like so important to me because I really recognize myself because I moved to uh, like uh, a town like Normandy uh, to Bretagne, you know, like to a small town in France to another small town in, Fr in France. So it's not like a big uh, discrepancy, like go going from Vietnam to, to France, like from a Asia to Europe. But still, the I'm, I think the, um, we are, because we are all uh, humans, the, the feelings are the same. So like um, they... Um, this book, you know, uh, um, resonate with a lot of people for um, like many reasons that are not. Um, um, <laughs> sorry, my English is so bad. <laughs> but uh, like, it's not made. It's not because they are Vietnamese uh, always, but sometimes because uh, of the the illness or the feeling of not belonging. So this is also what I liked about the reception is that it is so. Uh, diverse and I mean as a writer this is important to me because I think when it's universal uh, this is when we all uh, join like literature for me is that is that some somebody tell its own story that is very specific but then it resonates with you uh, because we are all human so I think this is what like uh, I like the most about the reception of this book. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. <laughs> thank you, everybody. I loved. <laughs> Words are the bridge. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. Buy the book. It's aesthetically beautiful as well, not just, you know, the words inside, but it's really laid out gorgeously. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody.